So we're resuming with session two, uh, which is a panel on the local, national, global continuum. Uh, Daniel Banks will frame that, uh, uh, I think, more articulately than I. But uh, we asked Daniel to moderate this. He's an extraordinary director, choreographer, educator, writer. His own work uh, in hip hop theater uh, has been in Ghana uh, and around the world, and is also, uh, in terms of embodying the continuum and the dynamic between working locally and immediately in communities with his own company, DNA Works, uh, and working across the world. Daniel uh, epitomizes this as well as anyone I know. So uh, please welcome Dr. Daniel. Thank you, Derek. Just to give the panelists a moment to breathe and settle in, I, I want to uh, respect the dialogic nature of what we're doing and just see if I can get maybe five volunteers to quickly blurt something that you're thinking about. It doesn't have to be a well-articulated sentence and it does need to be brief, but let's, mm -hmm. let's you know, great creativity comes with, with confinement and restriction and structure and form. <coughs> so um, could I have just five hands quickly and then what? And then you can blurt. One, two, three. Okay, three blurts, great. So a blurt. Could you stand up and introduce yourself, please? I'm Barbara Mujica, I'm in the Spanish department, and uh, I teach theater and direct theater uh, and do other theater related things. Um, I've been thinking about the issue of uh, top acts, and I've been thinking about it for a long time. Uh, I work with Ghana Hispanic Theater, and I have often, very often, directed the epilogues, the, the top back se section. I've been doing it for years, decades. Um, However, although there's some, they are often very, very successful, and my students like them, and the audience like, likes them, there are times when one sees a performance that is so powerful, and so moving, and so emotionally devastating, that when the lights go on, all you want to do is go away and be with yourself and your thoughts. And sometimes having to talk about it and intellectualize about it and analyze it and become the professor ruins the experience. So I think that talkbacks have uh, their place, or pre discussion, pre performance discussions could have their have their place. But I also think that some of that depends on the nature of the show. Some of it depends on the nature of the audience. And I think that before we just mandate that it should be this way or it should be that way at this theater or that theater, that every situation should be considered individually. Thank you. Roberta, just a quick sort of couple of words, couple of phrases, a blurt. A blurt. Okay. <laughs> not a dissertation, a no. blurt. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try. I'll blurt really fast. I'll just do it by points. So, Great. Roberta Levitel, hello. Um, my first point is the questions raised I thought were excellent for all of us uh, who work in international work anywhere in the country, not just in DC. Uh, the question of proxy writers versus international artists speaking for themselves. The question of uh, languages in translation and finding new theatrical languages to pre present those languages in translation. Uh, the question of contextualizing any uh, community and culture that the audience itself is not familiar with. The question of measuring impact and being able to describe that impact and articulate that impact. Um, the question of creating a public conversation and. Uh, Quick anecdote, uh, Katrine Few talking about how in Cambodia, after her play, the audience stayed for four hours and began to tell stories they'd never told before because they had the forum and the moment to uh, share the stories. Um, and the last thing, just to say that um, while DC um, was moving, and uh, great to hear everybody talking about how they're struggling here and resonated so much with struggles. I'm from LA, another international city. But one thing we don't have, when we have an audience, we have a casting director sitting in the audience. But when you have an audience, you have a State Department member sitting in the audience. Thank you. Well, Shahid Nadeem from Adoka Theatre, Pakistan. 
Firstly, I uh, fully endorse the comments about uh, the, the dangers of uh, talk back. Sometimes you can spoil the, not only the, the mood uh, of the uh, members of audience, but also sometimes it can be very unfair for the artist. One pre-opinionated, articulate person can really mm -hmm. steal the post-show. Show. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, uh, there have been, in the previous session, uh, people have talked about uh, sensitizing the, the audience and making them more aware or interested in international theater. Uh, but I think there's also a need to sensitize the sensitizers, mm -hmm. like uh, the theater practitioners, because last year at the PCT conference in LA, uh, I had the chance to uh, participate in a panel which talked about theatre in the conflict zone. So I thought uh, it would be of great interest to American um, theatre people, there were about a thousand of them, that some of them, maybe a score of them will come and want to know how theatre is being done in such difficult situations like Iraq, Pakistan and some other countries. But the attendance was quite uh, Pathetic. So I think there is uh, also need to motivate the motivators. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have one contrary view on the talk back thing from a diplomacy perspective. I actually found as an ambassador that the through using forms of uh, creative expression, I did more with movies than theater, but I did occasionally theater as well you could have extraordinary conversations after them um, that you could never have under any other circumstances because people are in that magical in, emotional moment that only lasts for a couple of hours after a performance. And I guess I would say if you want to go be by yourself, go be by yourself. No one's stopping you. But, but I'm more with you, Roberta, for the space that that opens up to have the kind of engaged conversations that are often very difficult to have. And of course, one person can run away with it. That's why you have to have a half-decent moderator. Uh, but if you do, and you can capture that magical moment, you can do really extraordinary things that you can't do any other time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that will come out in our panel there, Susan, is that when she took her controversial production, The Top Secret, to not that controversial, but mm -hmm. uh, well, you'll hear about it, to China. The Chinese government wanted to stop the talkback session. They let her have the play, but they recognized that the danger was in talking about it and what might come out of that. So, gee, if they want to stop it, I certainly hope we won't. <laughs> well, as I suspect, um, over the course of the next two and a half days, there will be a lot of um, complimentary and uh, slightly tugging opinions happening, and this is a great space for all of that to coexist. They don't have to be resolved, and I think it's it's great just to let different opinions be in the air, and I think we probably, many of us as practitioners, on some days we feel one way about one issue, and on another day we feel another way, and on one show we do it one way, and another show we do it another way, so there's even a dialogism within ourselves as, as, as practitioners and thinkers and scholars. I, I actually need to move to this panel, so if you let me, um, I'm going to segue into this panel, and then I'm sure there will be lots of time over two and a half days for us to continue to tease some of these things out. So, with your permission, um, the, we've, we've been hearing, one of the things that I think is really important that already started to get unpicked in that first panel is the difference between international programming, international exchange, travel, um, you know, presence, bodies, languages, all of these things are starting to come up and they're not necessarily all the same thing. And this is a great, uh, I think, um, you know, the, the, the uh, creators of this program have done a really great job of putting this panel next because it talks about some of these very tensions um, for people who are uh, living in one place and then possibly working in that place and or working in other places and the tensions that that might produce in terms of priorities, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, sweat equity and amount of time spent in places. So I, I actually want to begin with um, something that Michael Rode, uh, who's, who many of you may know from Northwestern University and Sojourn Theater, sent to Derek, I believe it was this morning, late breaking, <laughs> this just in everybody. Um, in what ways, if any, 
Is it relevant that Georgetown University sits amidst a city and a nation's capital where, although great work occurs, the arts and civic discourse do not often function in deeply, comprehensively successful partnership with each other? Where diplomacy at the local level is on many levels a failure, in what ways, if any, are the university's resources needed desperately at home as it is also looking around the globe to address tactics and partnerships it has not mastered in its own backyard? The question does not imply the local and global are mutually exclusive. It asks for an examination of how priorities are arrived at, and it asks for an interrogation of the lure of the brand to the sometimes detriment of the everyday. Uh, so that's not the Georgetown is not the topic of this panel, but I think that the 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 the, the, the tension that Michael articulates is very much the topic of this panel. So since we haven't had a chance to all get on the same page yet because we all just arrived, uh, I'm also going to let uh, the convening as well as the panelists know how this is going to work. Uh, we have David Diamond in the front row who has um, little uh, five minute and one minute sheets. Some of you expressed <laughs> some of you expressed an interest in having a, a timekeeper. I felt this was perhaps the gentlest, kindest way to do it. <laughs> uh, you, you've been what asked does that mean? to- Five minutes to go? Five minutes five left. Minutes. Five, minutes five minutes left and left. one minute left. Okay. You've been asked by the conference to speak for 10 minutes or less mm -hmm. about the work that you do and your thoughts about this um, either continuum or tension or both between the local, the national, and the international. I'm just looking to see if there's anything else I want to say here. Um, and how do you address and or balance needs in all three spaces? So. The bios are in the program and on the website. I'll, I'll do what Derek did and go down the list so you know who each person is, and then we'll just allow it to flow in this order. I've asked the panelists to self-select the order in which they would speak. First, we have Jonathan Hollander, who is the artistic director of Battery Dance Company. Next, we have Pam Corza, who is co-director of Animating Democracy, a project of Americans for the Arts. Uh, next, we have Christina Ev Christine Evans, a noted Australian playwright and assistant professor of theater and performance studies at Georgetown. Uh, next, we have Christina Scheffelman, director of artistic operations, Washington National Opera. And then we have uh, Jennifer Nelson, director of special programming at the Forge Theater, an adjunct professor of theater and performance studies here at Georgetown. And uh, at the end, uh, last but not least, we have our commentator, uh, Diane Ragsdale, who after each uh, panelist has spoken, will give a kind of a summation or some, some thoughts, and then we will open it up uh, to the community. And Diane is the former program officer for performing arts at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So with that said, Jonathan. Well, thank you for inviting me. I feel like I'm an ambassador from the world of dance um, <laughs> in this realm of rich theater. Um, also from Lower Manhattan in New York City, and some of the comments that were made about Washington, D.C. and the issue of these different populations and societies are certainly something that was formative in Battery Dance Company's history 36 years ago when we sort of put our stake in the ground in the Wall Street area and felt that we were in territory that was um, alien to some extent and that put up a lot of walls that would prevent us from penetrating our own community. And um, really from that beginning to the point where we are now, where we've been in 54 countries and where we work in New York City public schools and produce New York City's longest running dance festival, um, I think we've been informed by where we started in our community and our relationship with our local community. And that the enrichment that we've experienced in terms of learning uh, how to work with young people in New York City public schools, for example, how to communicate with an audience from Wall Street banks and, and insurance companies, um, and how to work in a university that gave us a home for the first five years, Pace University, that was basically an accounting school at that time how to bring dance and make it relevant and communicative in those environments has certainly um, given us a pathway as we go to Cambodia, as we go to China, um, Lesotho, or Brazil. But I, I want to step back from the institutional position. I'm a choreographer, and I started this company because I needed a vehicle for my own expression and development as an artist, and I was 24 years old. And I, was, I had been in, uh, I danced with Twyla Tharp, and I was a scholarship student with Merce Cunningham. And I kind of 
found a drive inside myself that was saying, you need to make your own dances, and you need to find a way to do that. So there was an organic beginning that set all of the rest of it in motion. I should also say that I grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland. I went to Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. So when you were talking about the um, international influences here in Washington, my classmates were as likely to be from other countries as they were um, locals. And so that interaction, um, and also then becoming an American Field Service exchange student and living in India when I was 16, so that I was introduced to Indian classical dance forms at the same time that I was learning about ballet and modern dance. Um, all of these things obviously fit into who I, who I am in my DNA as an artist. Um, fortunately, I've been able to find people, um, like-minded artists, collaborators, board members, um, who helped me, joined with me in forwarding this mission of taking a small uh, modern dance company from, um, that was concerned about bringing art into its community in this very dry, work-a-day world and bringing art into the workplace and then taking that out around the world. Um, so certainly I am part of a team right now and I've sort of graduated from dancer to choreographer to artistic director to um, whatever I am now, a spokesperson. Um, and unfortunately I feel that the dance world is way behind the theater world in terms of um, this international engagement and I'm hoping that uh, by example people will follow in our footsteps or find their own way towards this very rich engagement which has not only given us opportunity to work when a lot of companies are sort of in the sh on the shelf um, but also has fed the artistic inspiration of my work and of the work of my teaching artists who are now becoming choreographers in their own right. And I'm very proud to say that they got a fabulous review from Alastair McCauley, who likes nothing, um, <laughs> in New York a couple of months ago. Um, so speaking about that, we've coined a term, it's probably used by a lot of people, teaching artists. And the teaching artists in my company have sort of learned the rules of the road in New York City public schools. If you can engage a high school student in some of the schools that we work with, then you can do it anywhere. And um, they do. And the, the means by which we um, engage students is that we, we don't talk at them the way I'm talking to you right now, but we go into a classroom or a studio or a gym, whatever space we can find, and we lay down the rules, and that the rules are that we're not going to show you anything. You already know something, and we're going to help you unlock the door so that you can figure out how to do that. Teams are built, choreography is generated, and at the end of five days, the students have created their own piece of choreography. Now, this process has been translated around the world, but we learned how to do it in New York City Public Schools, and I don't think we could have done it anywhere else had we not done that. Um, Stepping back from that process, which is called Dancing to Connect, and it's now been in 30 countries, um, and we'll go to South Africa, Tanzania, and Greece in the next few months. Um, the Downtown Dance Festival has been a wonderful opportunity for us because we are the producers and presenters. We basically have no sponsorship. I mean, this is run on a nickel. But we have been able to bring dance companies from Slovakia, Poland, uh, Malaysia, um, and various, in India every single year because of my uh, involvement with, with India. And because we reciprocate, when we go to places, we're looking for talent and we have an opportunity to offer. We have a Singaporean company, a Malay uh, dance and music group that's coming this summer. We met them when we were in Singapore last fall. And so I find that this is a, a tremendous calling card for us that we're able to um, it, it's not all about thrusting ourselves overseas, it's, it's about creating a dialogue. A lot of the productions that we have done have involved artists that we've encountered overseas. Um, I created, Rabindranath Tagore was mentioned earlier, and um, I first heard a Tagore song in Calcutta in 1994, and then met Bengali musicians in New York. Of course, New York is such an incredible place that you can find, you know, maestros from all over the world. 
and we collaborated on a production that then went around the United States, through Europe, and to 17 cities in the Indian subcontinent. Um, it, it was a, an artistic expression of mine, but multiplied and made meaningful because of the interaction with Indian artists. The year that we took it to India was 1997, the 50th anniversary of India's independence. And in each city that we went to, we had a different Indian classical soloist. So mm -hmm. that's just an example of the kind of enrichment that I have felt personally in my artistic growth and that exemplifies the kind of work that Battery Dance Company is doing. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I wrote out my notes just so that I would stay within time and as a lapsed arts histo art historian I also brought images because I feel like I have a sort of security blanket with images. So Toby, my new friend, is going to help with that in the back of the room. Uh, so go for it, Toby, the first one. I'd like to start by sharing two moments from Animating Democracy's past. First, um, let's rewind to 2001. It's in Los Angeles, and at that time, Animating Democracy is funding Cornerstone Theater Company to develop and implement its four-year faith-based theater cycle. The plays in the cycle explore how faith unites and divides people in American society, and the cycle includes 21 original community-based plays created in collaboration with interfaith communities. The importance and the urgency of this project becomes acutely apparent in the unexpected context of the September 11th attacks. At the Islamic school where one of the plays was developed and performed, officials deliberate whether to cancel the events because of the safety concerns for all involved, but ultimately choose to continue as planned. This turns out to be the most heavily attended play, providing a much critically needed opportunity for community dialogue about the tensions that were being experienced in that local community, as well as worldwide. Uh, next slide, Toby. So now, fast forward just to last week, New York City. I'm sitting among 400 corporate leaders attending a conference called Courageous Conversations. Many of these corporate folks have titles with words like corporate social responsibility, global partnerships, corporate citizenship. Sessions include topics such as making multi-sector co collaborations work, lessons from the White House Council for Community Solutions, and courageous leadership on challenging issues, and they talk about human trafficking, HIV, AIDS, and other issues. Americans for the Arts, through its uh, relationship with the Committee Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy, which, uh, which is the sponsor of the conference, arranged for the American Records Theatre Company to perform an excerpt of re-entry in which several characters speak their truths of re-entering civilian life following military duty in Iraq, in Iraq and Afghanistan. The audience of corporate folks is riveted. This performance, along with three others that were infused into the conference, begins a process of building awareness among corporate leaders about how the arts might align with and advance their interests and concerns to do well, but also to do good. Uh, next slide, Toby. So Animating Democracy is a program of Americans for the Arts, which is a national service research and advocacy organization based here in Washington, D.C. And Animating Democracy, in particular, works to inform, inspire, and connect arts as a contributor to civic engagement uh, and to community civic and social change. As our support of Cornerstone Theater and many others, Sojourn and um, Urban Bushwomen and uh, Liz Lerman Dance Exchange and so on in the early years, as that support demonstrates, we place high value on local arts-based work. We're interested in work that is intentional, in how it applies the unique capacities of art to enhance knowledge, to improve discourse, to build civic capacity, to contribute uh, to and improve policy or change negative conditions uh, to possibly even make systems change. The local is where the rubber hits the road, as someone else earlier used the phrase, I love that one, and where hearts and minds are, are certainly changed. Of course, many issues like immigration, like the re-entry of military personnel to their home communities, have implications all along this local, national, global continuum. 
as we, continue, as we consider making impact along this continuum, we have to, however, acknowledge that such complex issues demand more than one-off projects and programs. And I might dare say amongst all of you, you know, single performances. Um, but they demand scaled up and sustained efforts. This in turn requires strategic alliances among agencies that can work with artists, that can situate artists in the right context and, and help those cultural agents. Uh, at Animating Democracy and at Americans for the Arts, we're increasingly intrigued by concepts of collective impact, of whole government, and even imagining beyond partnership toward embedding or integrating arts and culture into the work of other sectors. Uh, next slide. So I'd like to put on the table two cross-sector opportunities that were discussed at Americans for the Arts and Sundance Institute's uh, annual National Arts Policy Roundtable in uh, 2009, a few years ago. The theme was strengthening the role of the arts in 21st century global community. And the roundtable's goal was to identify strategies toward realizing deeper and more positive global relationships with and through the arts. Next slide. Um, and the first question that I'm sort of framing is how might corporations, this, since this is in my mind from last week's experience, how might corporations operating locally, nationally, globally help advance cultural diplomacy? At the round table we had the Hitachi Foundation, and their example might actually uh, teach us a few lessons. In the 1980s, the U.S.-Japanese business environment was characterized by mistrust of Japanese companies. It was rooted in Japan's rise as an economic power and the history of World War. Hitachi established foundations in the United States to help the company learn about the cultural context for business and to help build roots and establish relationships in the communities where their employees work and live. The foundation became a catalyst for hands-on volunteer and philanthropic efforts by employees and executives, and these efforts became part of the fabric of the local communities. Exchange programs were developed featuring Japanese and American cultural um, forms. These programs allowed leaders in both countries to examine substantive issues, share lessons, and solve problems. The foundation's cultural efforts were seen as a business imperative for Hitachi, grounded in an ethos of corporate citizenship. So today, many businesses uh, must understand in, in multiple cultures because that's where they're operating. Uh, co corporations tend to have long-term presence in places around the world where they do business and where their employees are living and working as part of those communities. Um, this kind of uh, platform um, may provide a, a much needed sustained kind of focus and corporations have resources. Uh, and certainly as, as a result of last week's forum, which I was able to sit into part of, increasingly um, corporations have a commitment to a, a level of social responsibility that is um, worth noting. And an opportunity I think exists there to integrate the arts. So the question uh, is, can we imagine partnerships between arts agents and corporations that integrate performing arts and theater strategies to achieve cultural diplomacy goals? What are the cautions? What, it, what would it take to really do this well? Next slide. Um, participating in our round table also was retired Brigadier General Nolan Bivens. He's from the US Army. He envisioned a role the arts can play in phase zero operations. This is stuff I know nothing about, by the way. <laughs> These are operations that help prevent conflicts by promoting stability and building capacity in partner nations through interagency and non-governmental coordination. As he described one such operation in Central and South Americas and the Caribbean, that sent medical crews to serve communities in need and to train military personnel, he imagined, that General Bivens imagined, what greater impact could be made if arts and cultural practitioners were also engaged. In an essay that he wrote after the, after the round table, he outlined not one, not two, but eight specific strategies for arts integrated into such phase zero operations as well as those kinds of missions serving families and communities at home and abroad. 
He underscored the need for a whole government approach that ensures strategic interagency alliances to make such endeavors happen and happen with the greatest possible impact. Um, and he framed uh, that desired impact of cultural diplomacy as nothing less than contributing to the prevention of conflicts in the interest of national security. Uh, so, I, in my last minute, I would like to um, close with a question that Animating Democracy is asking about the so social impact of the arts. And this is a, a question that, you know, we're hearing already from other speakers, and it's been part of a, an arts and civic engagement impact initiative that we've had going on for a few years. It seems like a simple question, but inherently um, it's very complex, and that question is, Kobe, <laughs> what difference are we making and how do we know? Um, to integrate, to, you know, thinking about integrating arts and cultural work into phase zero operations or corporate social responsibility um, approaches or, or any other sector's, you know, activities will require making the case for the role of the arts in terms of um, how it can make a difference, what value added it, it brings, and what difference uh, in the end are made in terms of national security, economic development, health and education, human rights, or, or any other kind of diplomacy goals. So um, I'll just echo what, what Andy and, and a few others have already said. How do we measure and communicate the value added by the arts and their contributions? Uh, and so as we talk over these next few days, I'm really curious to hear um, about both your, your own cross-sector kinds of ideas or aspirations uh, or needs, um, possibly experiences that you've had and, and what you've encountered there, uh, but also um, more how you frame intentions and expectations for the role of the arts in, uh, in this context of cultural diplomacy. Thank you, Pam. Steve. Hello, everyone. Um, so, I, w I would like to talk about a project that I'm involved in making at the moment. One of my collaborators uh, on that project is here. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to just change gears a little and tell you a story. Um, I'm a playwright, and I would like to just uh, tell this story that came out of my own focus because I want to wind back the questions that I'm thinking about here from this large question of what the arts can do to, for me, as a practitioner, a question that comes before it, which is, what is it to make art, and what is, you know, what is that process, what is the object that can apparently do all these things, you know, because I, I think the language can very often move towards the instrumentality and the usefulness and the educational force of art, and in fact, for those of us who make it, the question of what is it in the first place, I, I think needs to also remain in this sort of tense, double focus with this question. And for myself as a practitioner, that, that's always part of the struggle and the question. Hence, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, this is a story from the first play that I made in Australia that really kind of did well and found a, a sort of a larger audience, and um, which no one here has ever heard of because it was in Australia. But um, it was a play called My Vicious Angel. Uh, I really struggled to write it because I was learning to be a playwright at the same time as I was making this play. I'd come from ensemble-based theatre and circus, and so I was struggling to make this play out of language and out of my, my knowledge of, of bodily practice. Um, and it ended up being a story about a circus performer who falls from a very great height and breaks her spine. And she's immobilised in a spinal brace and is haunted by the ghost of her dead sister. So it ends up being a kind of a poetic play about the relationship between memory and grieving and the past. Play that in this kind of circus-themed performance style. And, you know, when I was writing it, I was thinking about my previous life in the circus and about the story I wanted to tell and about the music and all of these things. And then one day in Adelaide, where the play premiered, I met some local playwrights, one of whom was in a wheelchair and had, had his spine broken you know, 15 years ago and was now very active as a playwright and as a disabled playwright. And he said to me, I'm really looking forward to coming to see your play because I hear that it's about someone with a disability and a broken spine and you never see that on stage. And of course I was immediately smitten with complete and utter terror because I had tried to tell the truth of imagining 
this immobilised person in order to tell this completely other kind of story. So I was terrified of this man coming to see my play, you know, thinking, oh God, it has to be worthy in all of these ways, and I haven't thought about, does it represent a disabled person in a good way, etc., etc. I just tried to write a true play from a character that I'd imagined in a very specific way. So he came, and it was a stormy night. Almost no one else came to see the play this night because it was a storm, you know, so I was sort of... I really didn't want to go myself because it was raining and cold. <laughs> I was sitting up the back in this wretched, shivering state while this very nice, very smart, thoughtful man had arranged for somebody to hire a special taxi and probably spent $70 to get a carer to help him to come there on his taxi to see my wretched play that wasn't anything about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was sitting there sweating and shivering and feeling sick for the whole play and then afterwards you know, there was no audience, so there was nothing for it. I couldn't scuttle out, you know. <laughs> and, and we were sitting at the bar together, and I said, thanks so much for coming out. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and he looked at me, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, how did you know? And this, I tell you this story, because for me, this is an absolutely defining story in my politics and poetics and process as a playwright, and I take it into the way that I approach thinking about the connection between local and specific work into the international side of things. And I, I think that art specifies, and if you start from the specific, and if you start from attempting to find the truth, rather than from a kind of outside-in perspective of how do I tell a story that isn't mine and that I, I don't know, then you have a better chance of connecting from where you come from. And I, I learned that, and I, that gave me a lot of courage to remember that what I have is imagination, you know, and I don't mean this in a sort of soppy, mushy way that we imagine things and we are all one and so forth. I mean that <laughs> there is, there is a, a force and a clarity that comes with being able to follow that or being willing to follow that that is its own thing that then may become instrumental and useful and part of a wider conversation. But if you don't start from that, there's nothing to have a conversation from, okay? How many minutes have I got there? Yeah, I've got five. I've got five. <laughs> okay. So in the second part of this conversation, having prefaced it with that, I want to talk a little bit about the work that Joseph Meagle, the director, and I, and our third collaborator, Jared Rizzocchi, are doing. We're making a piece called You Are Dead, You Are Here, a ghost story for the digital war age. And the second point I want to make about the continuum of local to national to international is that all of these things in the world that we're in are happening in the same time and space in heavily mediated ways. You know, we often think that they aren't, but um, You Are Dead, You Are Here uh, started life as a very small commission to write a piece that had integral video in its, in its structure. And so my question was, why does it have to have video? I don't want to make something that's just bells and whistles. And so the, the starting impulse for this came from um, looking at the imaging technology that the military are using in rehabilitation for soldiers coming back from war and also in training soldiers for war. And as someone who comes from outside of this country, one of the things that's been very distressing and interesting to me is the way that the US tends to reflect back on itself all the time, even when appearing to be looking outwards. You know, so many of the conversations are, what can we do as Americans and so on? Uh, uh, and the idea that... Um, video game technology was being used to create images of Iraqis in order to help American soldiers train for war and then recover from the impact of that war it was very interesting to me because the missing part of that puzzle seemed to be the material body of those people so represented. So my question was really about what can appear in the frame of this representation and we started making this piece in dialogue with virtual Iraq which is um, a virtual reality program that creates animated landscapes of Iraq and it's used in um, military rehabilitation here in the US to help American soldiers with PTSD uh, image and recover from their traumatic experience. So we're building a piece that uses this technology and uses the animated landscapes of Iraq to tell a story about an American veteran going through this. And the third character in our play is a girl who is blogging out of Fallujah at the same time. And in the end, you see that the two stories join up. And the idea with this is, is to put the landscape of living through a war and the landscape of um, remembering back through a war in the same space through the technology that makes these two things come together. 
you know, so that so it's very important to me in making this piece that the girl blogging from Fallujah, this character in the play, can only appear in the space of an American theatre through the technology that was available, which is the space of the blog, the space of the weblog. And the same technology is also the technology of storytelling and memory for the traumatised soldier. And I feel that in this, this very, the very simple thing that we're attempting to do is to put these two stories together in the same space that are not usually supposed to be in the same space via the technology that actually exists to do that. Um, one minute. Um, and to conclude, I think that one of the reasons that we're trying to do that is because, for me, the abiding and burning question is, what can appear in this space? How is this experience framed? And I think we have to be careful not to go too quickly to what is this art about and what can it do to the question of, what specifically is it and how can it appear in this space? What are the rules of representation governing this work? And how can we make those appear in space? And, and then I think we have a starting point for those ongoing conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And Christina, please. Yes, thank you for having me. I felt when I was invited recently a little bit like the odd one out in this conversation. But um, on the other hand, I also feel that opera is a uh, really well kept secret as far as applied cultural diplomacy is concerned. Because music, first of all, doesn't require any language as far as communication is concerned. They're dots on a piece of paper, you play them, and usually they evoke emotion or a feeling, and that goes beyond any language, beyond any um, uh, countries and, and cultures, actually, because in the emotional appeal of music is pretty much cross-cultural. Um, we also, in doing opera, we all perform in Italian, Russian, German, English, Sanskrit even, I mean, in any possible language. And the singers that participate, the conductors, the stage director, the assistant stage directors, all have to understand what's going on, but they don't have to be fluent in those languages. But we, we bring people together from all countries. I mean, the last production we did has 10 principal roles that, that came from eight different countries. Two years ago, I had a production of Merit of Figaro. We had people from 14 different countries in this production. And there is one goal, which is to perform the music. And the, the music in whatever language it is written. The singers don't necessarily speak that language fluently, but they have to confront themselves with the culture where this music comes from, where the story comes from. So in a way, you have to learn about a culture, about a country, about a language that you probably hadn't heard about before. Um, our young artists, now young artists program, when they learn Italian opera, when they learn Mozart, they don't even, they don't only have to learn something about Italian, they have to learn something about Mozart, about Austria, about the history of when Mozart lived. And all these impulses that opera give kind of automatically create a connection, a cross-cultural connection. I mean, to me, it never was, uh, the international dialogue to me was never such a big issue because the dialogue among people that do music is irrelevant as far as where you're coming from. It doesn't really matter. I, I'm lucky that I lived in four different, I am German, I lived in four different countries. Uh, I, I have worked with artists from all over the world and because we have one <coughs> goal which is to perform a piece of music that through the notes gives us certain limitations and parameters it is a goal that is in a way flexible but in another way it's not theater has in its pacing much more possibilities. You can stand still for five minutes and wait until you do your next line. Mm -hmm. Music doesn't have that. Music, you could. I'm not saying you could. <laughs> you could. But, or you can drag out a line in a different way with more pauses. When you have music, it is what it is. You, you can pace a little faster or a little slower. But music gives a frame that everybody has to agree on. And there's something incredibly touching about this because you 
you don't care where you come from. You sing the music and the music will speak to somebody's heart. I know that's very simplistic maybe, but having experienced so many productions with artists, singers from all those countries, there is something very touching. And there is a moment where everybody realizes, oh, with you I have to speak English, you have to speak Italian, you have to speak German, you know. Somehow you find two or three languages as common ground and the communication works. And sometimes I even had um, people that spoke a language that was not shared by anybody, but through the music, in the score, the goal was achieved. And therefore I, I love opera and I love music because of what it can do on an emotional basis, no matter where you come from. And that's very touching and very exciting to me because I don't have to create a, an intentional connection or you know, a communication with a different language. I have a universal language that is incredibly appealing and will reach you. I mean, why, why is opera or classical music, Western classical music, so appealing to the Japanese? I'm not sure, but obviously it pushes an emotional button that, is, that works for them. They don't speak Italian, especially 20, 25 years ago when, when opera became much more popular in Japan, also in South Korea, and, and now also in China. It wasn't through the language. It was through the music. And that is so powerful to me, actually, as far as connecting on an international level. The connection starts with the singers on stage, of course, but it also goes to the audience, actually. Because you can perform um, Rigoletto or Traviata in any country, even if you don't understand every word, you probably will feel what is being expressed. And that's where the, the, uh, the understanding and the connection happens. And I think that some, sometimes I think opera could be used a little bit more in that sense because it does bring people together um, not through the culture, not through the specific language that we talk to each other and understand each other in, but through an emotional level that goes beyond that. Yes, opera is expensive. I, I can't, um, can't deny that, but that's why it's also such an incredible art form because it brings together high art, music, crafts, you need, you need seamstresses, you need lighting designers, you need orchestra, you need chorus, you need the singers, you need electricians, you need, you need um, uh, your carpenters, you need assistant stage managers, you need a set designer. It doesn't matter where they come from or which language they speak because the goal is to design a visual that provides the frame to them form the music in, and that is not language specific. And that's why I personally believe very much in opera as something that can um, create connections, cross-cultural connections, international connections, that can be very strong and very powerful, and I've seen it firsthand. That's what I'm really about. Thank you very much. Jennifer, please. <coughs> please. <laughs> and thank you. Um, I, I'm so nervous, I started feeling like, why am I up there? Um, <laughs> okay. See how that's how art connects us. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm going to start by saying, I, I think the reason that I went into the arts, besides the fact that I had a very creative family, is because I never felt like I belonged anywhere. Uh, a lot of my childhood was spent um, being the only black kid in whatever the environment was. My dad was in the military and we traveled a lot. And in almost every single environment, there, there would be two black kids in the school, it was me and my sister. And so I, I never felt like I was a part of what I just didn't feel like a part of it. And the thing that, that saved me was learning to read and imagine. So when you said imagination, I wanted to cheer. <laughs> because I think that's the thing, ultimately, that is the wellspring of art, is that every human being imagines 
on some level or another, whether it's imagining that you've got more food, imagining that you've got a better house, that you have a better life, there is something very elemental in the human capacity to dream of things that don't exist in the real world. And then what we do with that dream, what we do with that imagination becomes art. Whether we sing it, dance it, act it, write it, paint it, whatever. Other things you can come up with now. We've got new art forms either. Sometimes it's how else can you imagine that you can express it, that you know, that, so that, that, uh, that, that you never run dry. Also, it, it, it's a river that is endless, endless. Um, I was very lucky, I think, in retrospect now that I'm in my 60s, that I grew up in the 60s. I kind of came of age in the 60s because it was a time in this country of such turbulence. And s particularly for African Americans, for such a, an unease of not knowing what was going to happen next. You know, when where will I be? Where can I go? Who can I talk to? Etc. And it, so, you know, it, it, instead of the comfort of feeling really belonging to something, the, the discomfort, the uncomfort of feeling that you didn't belong, I think actually was, was critical. Because again, it meant it kind of spun me off back into the world of fantasy and of imagining things. Um, my, first it was books, and then it was movies. And, that, and then uh, my dad was an, was an amateur actor, and he always had scripts around the house. I started reading plays when I was like in the fifth grade. And reading plays, I had absolutely no idea what they were about. But I, I remember reading The Bald Soprano <laughs> when I was like in the sixth grade. And, <laughs> oh, what the fuck? But I read it all, <laughs> and, and I was absolutely intrigued. I, you know, then, then I, I read the, uh, so one where they go down the stair, he really loved French drama mm -hmm. for some reason, the, the uh, Mad Woman of Chaillot, mm -hmm. and the, you know, that whole going down the stairs, and I was, you know, enthralled by that, that concept. And so then, you know, it became kind of making up plays in my head of what, you know, how I would like to see things or how I would imagine a situation going. And there actually is a purpose for my telling this personal blather, a purpose. Um, but th that it, it took me a long time before I understood that everybody does this in one way or another. Maybe not in the same dimension that I was doing it in, doesn't matter, but that everybody, you know, was imagining themselves to be something that they were not, whether it was richer, poorer, thinner, fatter, whatever, the other gender, you know, it's whatever that we, that, you know, and, and then I lucked into being in the Living Stage Theater Company in the early 70s at Arena Stage. And Living Stage was, was created and led by a, a visionary kind of madman, Robert Alexander, and it was based on the notion that, ev that everybody has this imagination and that it, the, 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 the death of the, human, of the individual is, is, is involved with the death of the imagination, the squashing of the imagination. And so he set out to create a form of theater that worked with children and young people um, that was to say, imagine and that out of that will spring whatever it is, what comes next. We don't know yet, and we're not gonna try to tell you what you should be. What we wanna help you do is imagine what, what is the world that you wanna live in, and then that's the world that they will go on and create. And so for 20 years, I was an, I was an actor, and, and, and this is an improvisational company as well, I should add, so that we, didn't, we weren't using anybody's scripts. We were making up our own stuff. We were working with the poorest of the poor, uh, right here in Washington, D.C., um, and this grew into working in uh, prisons. We worked in uh, D.C. jail and, and also the maximum security men's prison that has now been moved out of the city. That's another story. Um, 
and eventually into working with disabled people of a variety of disabilities, with mental disabilities, physical disabilities at one point. So I could work with deaf people, work with people, you know, kids who could hardly move, you know, taking them out of their wheelchairs is something that we discovered that, kid, you know, kids in wheelchairs with real severe, very involved uh, physical disabilities are often just kind of, they're put in that category. They're just, that's who they are, they're in that wheelchair. Ah, you find out, take them out of the wheelchair, you know, and see what happens. And these are kids who could dance, I and mean, we had, I will go off, I go off into those stories. But, you know, that, at, at any rate, eventually I left that I, and started working in the regular theater in which I have learned a tremendous amount and, and found a, a certain measure of, of success. To, and yet the thing I feel that really drives me in what I have to say up here is about that the global is the individual. That, the, that in, to, to learn, to understand, to interact with people who are not like you, whether they are not like you because of the color of their skin or the language that they speak or the food that they eat or, you know, how they get around town, you know, that, that the core that unites us can be met in the realm of imagination. Um, and so what, what I try to do now with my life is figure out ways to teach young people that, to pass that message on. They don't have to do what I did. They don't have to do what any of us did. But find that in yourself that is holy and whole and work from that place to find that in other people. And, there, and thereby is a bridge. And it could be done in infinitely in, in an infinite number of ways. You can do all these wonderful stories, you know, that whether it's opera, dance, whether it's circus, or trapeze, whether it's po poetry, whether it's you know, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter. What matters is that point at which the life force between human beings meets and allows there to be a moment of comprehension and of understanding that I can look at you and see that we have more in common than we have not in common. Um, so I, I, I feel like it's become my mission in a way, my personal mission, to help young artists in particular understand that the lifestyle choice that they make if they decide to go into the arts as profession as a profession is has to be based in a commitment to social justice and equity for all people. And so I, I, I teach here sometimes and sometimes in other places. And what, what I'm teaching always is um, theater for social change and particularly, and since it's my background, improvisational theater for social change, because that's, the, that's where I grew up as an artist in the, in the improv world. Um, I, I recently had the experience of, of being involved in a, a local project. I want to mention that, it wasn't, that I was brought into as a writer, because I, I do that too. What was working with women in Washington, D.C. who are homeless, or have been recently homeless. Most of them had been substance abusers, women who have been through lives that you would want to know about, you know, and that we don't believe, and in a way you don't believe that happened right here in Washington, D.C., right now, going on. Um, and these are women who for, have found their way into a place where they can get some assistance. And part of the assistance that this organization provides for them is improvisational theater classes. And when, one of the things they were doing was a series where they were getting, asking the women um, to do improvs in which they would talk about themselves. They would tell stories about their lives, but not therapy, not reporting, just that, you know, that the stories would come out in the process of them. And my job was to kind of record some of the stories, and then they put together, we put together a script of their words and their stories that they then performed at the Kennedy Center. 
for one night that was probably the most important thing I've done in my life other than bear my daughter. Uh, that I, when I think about it, I start crying again. Be because it is such a, it was such a, oh, oops, okay. <laughs> Transformative experience to hear and see these people telling their own stories in a theatrical form with other people listening and hearing them and understanding them in a way that they possibly could not ever have done before. Which then, uh, finishing, I, there's a poem, there's a, a, a Lace and Hughes poem I want to close with. The poem, the song, the picture, the poem, the song, the picture are ah, water that belongs to the people that must be given back to the people in a cup of beauty that they can drink and thereby understand themselves. Thank you, Jen. That sounded like a period. <laughs> so um, before handing it over to Diane, I just want to um, say we have, we have been given special dispensation since we came back a little bit late from tea to, uh, to make up that time at the end. So um, we do about still 10, 15 minutes left on the panel. Diane, your thoughts? First of all, thank you all. That was wonderful to hear all of your stories and perspectives. <coughs> Maybe I'm going to come across as cynical. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up money, which wasn't mentioned by any of you. But, I, you know, I'm aware that, that um, uh, you know, when, a, when I've worked uh, not just in funding, I was also in, in, in working in arts organizations for years before that. And, you know, for a while there's been a huge imbalance, right? The other, other countries, Europe in particular, had subsidies that they would put into these sorts of exchanges. Uh, subsidies that they would put into these sorts of exchanges, and the United States did not, for the most part. And it, and so and you know you saw such things as the kind of work that was coming over was the kind of work that had subsidy attached to it, and then the kind of work that wasn't coming over didn't, you know, to some degree. With the exception, of, you know, Jonathan, I loved when you talked about the sort of your your on the ground relationship with people that enables some of that stuff to come over, and I think that is where some very powerful work is happening, but we're not cognizant of, of it to a degree, and we're not um, understanding how to how to foster that sort of thing. Uh, likewise, I, I think that the a lot of artists in the United States have used Europe as a way to, to subsidize their careers in America, because you can make more money going to Europe than you can here. And so, one, I think money you know, and, and where subsidies are or are not, Europe is, is to some degree less able to subsidize this work now. And I think um, in that space, then the intentions and the motivations can get conflated, right? Why, you know, is the back and forth happening because we're somehow now needing to capitalize, you know, work that's made in America by taking it overseas? Um, uh, you know, to what degree are things exploited um, in, in, in a way that's not helpful. And it seems to me that there's this vacuum of both money and, uh, and, and uh, an argument, policy argument, on the sort of cultural exchange and cultural diplomacy side that's running up against a creative economy conversation mm -hmm. that is all about exploiting uh, content, intellectual property, including culture, for financial gain that can lead us to sort of a, a, a you know a palatability in the work that goes around the world that may not be helpful, and and so I listen to all of you and I hear something very powerful and interesting happening, and I just worry about how how we raise this up in a way uh, and 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 demonstrate that this is this is what needs to be understood and fostered, and that it can't be sort of replaced by this other perhaps more powerful argument that's kind of coming at us from the other side. Uh, I actually think that maybe, so that we can hear from as many people as yeah. possible, um, if I could try to guide this a little bit by suggesting that, uh, going with this, this theme that I introduced earlier about our space being able to hold a multiplicity of opinions and views, could we take a page out of Liz Lerman's book and maybe just ask questions? Not even necessarily questions for the panelists, but just pose questions that this collection of stories and testimonials um, raises to mind for you about the tensions or the confluences between 
uh, the, the local, the national, and the global. And if you really have a burning comment you have to say, of course, uh, that there will be no uh, repercussions for that. But I'm, I'm just offering that, you know, in order to keep it um, pithy and hear from a lot of people, uh, if we could maybe frame our, our question. I'd like to make one quick comment only, talking about the uh, subsidies in Europe. Don't think, being a European, don't think that subsidies are always the ideal solution mm -hmm. to, um, I'm, no, I'm not saying this yeah. in response, they're not always the ideal solution. Subsidies yeah. also often lead to an immense amount of waste of money because it's not spent the right way, because it's there and uh, you know a, a theater or an opera company or a museum has a budget and if you spend less than the budget, the next year it gets cut. So you basically spend what is given to you. Sometimes the subsidies are not the answer to all, to all questions. And the system, having lived here in the US now for 17 years, I have a great admiration for how cultural institutions are being funded here by the private patron. I mean, there's also a lot to be said for that and that the interest of ver the various tastes and interests provide a variety of cultural institutions and output. And so, I mean, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. but the subsidies having been away from it for, for many years, I, I have a very critical attitude towards it. Yeah. So, as in a rehearsal process, any questions that we're not going to try to answer, but we'll just let it sort of linger for a couple of days? Yes, JJ. Um, I'm starting to wonder, I, I hear a lot of conversation where we reference our colleagues that work in other con countries. And it, it sort of struck me in, a moment ago as the, we're almost like collecting these trophies, like, oh, I've worked with this country and this country and this country, and I can name a whole bunch of colleagues in countries that I'll never visit, but I know people there. And I just wonder, my question is, why do we focus on the country and not the individual and that relationship? Because in many cases, as we all know, we don't always represent what the country puts out. You know, we, we don't always, we are not, we can't speak to our, ourselves for all of America. We can only speak for ourselves. So why do we always um, identify our colleagues that way as, as we are that country? Great, thank you. There was someone in front of you, yes. Yes, um, I just wanted to put the contrary view about um, philanthropy. Um, we in England are now going through the path, going down the path of philanthropy, and it's disastrous. Um, in many ways, the problem is that it leads, I think, to heritage arts, because no one is willing to give you the right to fail, and everyone's very happy for you to do traditional work and not challenging work, and at the same time, not work that reflects your community. So that an awful lot of um, black and Asian work that was happening in England is suffering now because it's not accessing that philanthropic money. And we have the same tax model as America. Unfortunately, we have a tradition where rich people consider the state should deal with the arts and should deal with the health system and should deal with the welfare system. So people are unwilling to give money, but I do think that it is very dangerous to go too far down that road and I think the National Endowment for the Arts in this country should have access to much more money and your arts would be healthier yes. if it did. Yes, questions? Uh, my question is, again, relating back to my experience as ambassador, when the, one of the charges of every ambassador is to promote uh, American commerce in the country and at that time aerospace products were our number one export, and I spent a whole lot of time um, doing that, and I have to say that I sold the Joint Strike Fighter and got a big award from the Pentagon with a citation that said, how can an art historian be so good at selling weapons? <laughs> one of those mysteries, that's a question out there, and you know, the answer. But, uh, but my, question, my question is, why is it that that was a mandate that I was expected to carry out and did, for the top uh, product of aerospace products. We all know now that creative products are always among the top three, one, two, or three, coming out of America. And yes, it's the commercial 
products that are generating the money, but we all know that fueling those commercial products are people from the nonprofit sector. And to my knowledge, it's never presented as a mandate of any sort to diplomats to do something with that sector of American commerce. Thank you. Uh, Cindy, and then over here. I appreciate it on this panel of opening up, I think, of, I think, I heard correctly, of the question about instrumentalizing art and the need for respecting the, integ the, the artistic integrity of the creative space in the context of this conversation about arts being engaged for purposes of diplomacy or peace building. Um, and I think the question that I have about that emerging from our project Acting Together on the World Stage, which we'll be talking about later, is um, how can we use uh, opportunities like this one to help uh, people who live in these different worlds, who are thinking in very different mindsets about what constitutes excellence in this work, to <coughs> appreciate and honor each other's knowledge, each other's um, way of understanding the, the transformative power of the art to be a both aesthetic experience and um, amplified perhaps in strategic ways that these builders think about. Thank you. I love it. I love all the stuff in the air. I'm one of those directors. Um, I have a question about the audiences um, for these performances that we've been talking about all day. You know, how, if we get the funding, if, how do we make sure, I mean, we have this problem in this country, I'm, I'm sure we have it abroad, that a very narrow sector goes to the theater. So how do we reach more people with the theater that we're making abroad and here? How do we make sure that when we bring a company from another country, all that way, how do we make sure that the people who should see that performance, see that performance. Thank you. And I'm going to add a corollary to that is, what do we mean when we say theater? Mm -hmm. And is there only one theater? Yes, please. Uh, I have a question, I guess, that has to do with, what is the connection between collaboration and voice? And uh, I, what I mean by that is implicit in, and, and wafting across many of the very interesting things people have been saying are different working assumptions and theories about uh, the relationship of cultural expression to communication. So one of the working theories is the transcendence of cultural expression. But uh, and Peter Marx and some others have suggested that this is a problem for us because we assume it's self-evident and communicative. But in fact, it's not. And so we have challenges when we have people in the room who don't really know what's going on or how to consume it or what it might mean. And so there are competing notions at play, I think, in our conversation. And it's interesting considering <coughs> what we're talking about, which is notions of the intersection of foreign affairs, cultural diplomacy, cultural expression, and the arts uh, regarding <coughs> just exactly what sort of collaborative possibilities they, they represent and what sort of context and attention to um, voice and meaning. And I guess another way of putting this is, how can we think about these engagements as open to multiple appropriations? Mm -hmm. Thank you. One, one last question, and then um, we can all try to answer each other's questions. Out of the mm -hmm. cool. Yes, please. OK. Um, I hope I can get this out properly. I'm Michael from Bond Street Theater. Um, one of the issues that I find in theater is the question of realism. If you're going to do a play like um, uh, Death of a Salesman, you can't have a Israeli Willie Loman and an Arab wife without that suddenly becoming something about the racial casting of it. Mm -hmm. It's something I really admire about the circus and what I'm learning about the opera uh, and dance. Because you can actually have very interracial company and that's not the question. But in theater, unless you're going to do a production like A Midsummer Night's Dream or something more fantasy, you can't put different races on the stage without it suddenly being about that. So I'm just throwing out the question of 
realism in the theater. And, the, and if you use realism, the only stories you can tell are realistic stories about realistic issues. And how can we get you know, on that? Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you.